I'm just um, delighted to welcome you to the final session of the Generative AI Coast to Coast webinar series. Um, my name is Sarah Stone and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Washington eScience Institute, which is one of the partner organizations for this series. If you're joining us for the first time today, these webinars are aimed at bringing together speakers across several peer institutions to discuss generative AI in research with the larger goal of really fostering a broad community of cross-institutional and interdisciplinary researchers with the hope that these conversations will spark new research ideas and collaborations among our institutions and more broadly. Um, for each session, um, we have two speakers from two different universities who are sharing their perspectives and recent work related to generative AI. Um, and then we'll follow those two um, presentations by an extensive audience discussion time. Um, and in case you have missed previous um, seminars in this series and you'd like to um, find their recordings, those all are available um, and posted on the Midas website. Um, and this one will be posted as well. Um, Audience members um, will have the option to submit questions um, both during the talks um, and also we've had some questions submitted ahead of time um, and those will help to seed our follow-up conversation. The participating institutions for this series include Johns Hopkins University Institute for Data Intensive Engineering and Science, the Ohio State Translational Data Analytics Institute, the International Computer Science Institute, the Ken Kennedy Institute at Rice University, my home institution of the eScience Institute at the University of Washington, and our host, host institution of the Michigan Institute for Data Science at, the, of course, the University of Michigan. Um, this series would not be possible without the series organizers, and I want to just say um, pr with particular attention to the Midas team um, for their heavy lifting and leadership to make this series possible. All right, so moving on to today's speakers. Um, first today, we will hear from David Evan Harris. Um, as a Chancellor's Public Scholar at UC Berkeley and continuing lecture, lecturer at the Haas School of Business, David Evan Harris teaches courses including AI ethics for leaders, social movements and social media, civic technology, and scenario planning and futures thinking. He is also a senior research fellow at the International Computer Science Institute, a senior advisor for AI ethics at the Psychology of Technology Institute, an affiliate faculty member with the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society Policy Lab, the Center for Latin American Studies, Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership, and also the Business and Public Policy Group at UC Berkeley. Um, in his previous role as research manager on responsible um, AI um, at Meta, um, this was from 2018 to 2023, he managed teams of quantitative and qualitative researchers that were really confronting some of the most challenging issues facing the company, including areas of civic integrity, misinformation, and responsible AI. Prior to that, David served as research director at the Institute for the Future. His research interests are AI ethics, misinformation, elections, social media, user experience research, deceptive design and digital literacy, and global development. Today, David will be talking about generative AI and elections, the open source problem. Following David's talk, we'll hear from Rada Milhalcha. Rada is, a Janice, is the Janice M. Jenkins Collegiate Professor of Computer Science and Engineering in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Michigan. Rada is Director of the Michigan Artificial Intelligence Lab and her research group on language and information technologies works on research projects in natural language processing, information retrieval, and applied machine learning. She also leads the, an NLP for Social Good initiative that aims to empower natural language processing researchers to expand the societal impact of their work. Her interests include NLP, computational social sciences, multimodal tracking, and understanding of human behavior. Today, Rada will be talking about moving beyond one size fits all and generative AI. 
We're delighted to welcome both of these speakers, and I will just at this point um, ask David to go ahead and share his screen, and we'll move forward with the presentations. Oh, actually, sorry, I have one more slide. I lied, David. <laughs> um, I just want to remind the audience so we don't miss this piece. Please put your questions in the Q&A at any time um, throughout the talks. As I mentioned before, we're going to take um, questions and do a discussion Q&A session following the two talks. Um, but please feel free to put your questions in any time. Um, also, um, I'll just welcome others to put um, and our speakers to put comments and answers in the Q&A um, if they would like to um, during each other's talks or real time. Um, and we'll collect these and share them with attendees after the event, again, in the effort of trying to foster and continue these types of conversations. So now, David, I'm, I'm saying it for real this time. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and please go ahead and share yours. Great. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Sounds great. All right. Um, hi, I'm David Harris. I'm very excited to be here today. Thanks so much to to the hosts and the uh, and University of Michigan for making this happen. And it's an honor also to um, share the stage uh, with Farada, uh, who will be speaking after me. Um, the talk I'm going to give is Generative AI and Elections, the Open Source Problem. Now, the asterisk there is about the definition of open source. And um, that is, I'm using the term loosely here. Uh, and specifically, I'm referring to large language models or other AI tools that have code and weights that are easily accessible publicly, even if the licenses prohibit certain types of uses. That's because what we sometimes call bad actors or even sophisticated threat actors Think about intelligence agencies full of spies or people trying to deliberately uh, use these tools for coordinated harm. They don't care about the licenses or uh, getting legal access. They just need the code and the weights to abuse LLMs or other generative AI systems. So if you want to read more about this, I, I uh, put out an opinion piece in The Guardian a couple months ago called AI is already causing unintended harm. What happens when it falls into the wrong hands? And that will give you more background. So this is what uh, we used to call when I worked at uh, Facebook, the war room. And the war room uh, was set up in order to get a team of people working usually around the clock to address threats to elections. And we set these up in 2018 to address the US midterm elections and the Brazilian presidential elections. Um, and we also uh, ran them many, many times after that for different elections all over the world. And these kinds of um, war rooms or, uh, oh, if people could turn off their video, that would be great. I, I see someone's uh, video on there. Um, in any case, uh, these war rooms were places where we would coordinate enforcement because sometimes in the in the space of a, an election, it becomes a really tight time frame where issues that crop up on social media need to be dealt with very quickly. Um, so I worked on, as I mentioned, the Brazilian and US elections in 2018, and then um, ended up doing research all over the world, uh, really, with, with teams. I managed teams of researchers, and, uh, and we worked on taking down all kinds of threats. And this is uh, one takedown that happened in 2019, uh, where we on the same same day announced removing uh, coordinated inauthentic behavior in Thailand, Russia, Ukraine, and Honduras. The Honduras said, I, I actually went to Panama and interviewed people um, from Honduras that had been uh, targeted. And these were these were human rights activists that had been targeted um, in campaigns. And, and I learned a lot about it by being there in person. I was lucky enough um, to get to do additional research in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East. And I spent a lot of time looking at what we called inside of the company at-risk countries. And those are places around the world that were deemed by the company, I didn't invent the term, uh, but deemed by the company to be at risk of, of harm uh, that could have some relationship to things happening on the platform. And that might be genocide, it might be a civil war, it might be election interference. And, uh, and that was my, uh, my, my task uh, was to work on that um, for a number of years. Uh, after working on what was called the civic integrity team, I went on to do some work with the misinformation team, the social impact team, and then the final team I worked uh, on in my almost five years at Facebook was called the Responsible AI Team. Um, so 
one person who I, I want to talk about here um, is uh, a, a really important character. Now, you might recognize uh, Vladimir Putin. Behind him is Yevgeny Prigozhin. And you might be aware that uh, he is reported to have died in a plane crash last week. Now, Prigozhin became a household name um, in, uh, in a in, in many different uh, ways in the last year with the invasion of Ukraine, he created uh, what's called the Wagner Group. And this is an image from a viral video of him going to Russian prisons to recruit soldiers for uh, basically cannon fodder for the front lines of, of the invasion of Ukraine. Um, but uh, Prigozhin didn't start there. Uh, he had many, many other things that he did uh, before the, and in addition to, and alongside the Wagner Group. Um, one of them was an organization that he set up in this building in St. Petersburg. And this is called the Internet Research Agency. And this was set up around 2015, 2016, and specifically set up to interfere in the 2016 US presidential election. There were reportedly about a thousand people uh, working for the Internet Research Agency. The, the details are a little bit hazy, but if you want to get uh, a, a pretty detailed but somewhat redacted version of this, um, of what happened, the Mueller report, which is public information, is actually a, a great archiving detailing of the different tactics that they use to interfere in the US and, and probably in other elections in, in different parts of the world. Um, now, it's useful to understand Prigozhin and, and what he did to actually just look directly to what he said. So um, this was last year. He actually gave a, gave a quote and said, um, gentlemen, we interfered, we interfere, and we will interfere. He, he didn't stop the work that he did to interfere in elections outside of, outside of Russia, including the U.S., um, with 2016. He, he admits here that it is an ongoing and continuous effort. And, you know, when I say interfere in elections also, it's important to note it's not just about um, disrupting the outcome of the election. Uh, it could also be just general inflammation of, of social tensions or trying to increase social cleavages in, in the United States. The second quote is even more disturbing, uh, carefully, precisely, surgically, and in our own way, as we know how. During our pinpoint operations, we will remove both kidneys and the liver at once. Um, so it's it's pretty brutal and it's pretty precise and it's pretty sophisticated. And what we have yet to really grapple with is, as a society is what people like Prigozhin or his successors will be able to do taking full advantage of large language models and image generation AI tools to create fake content and interfere in elections. So this is Vladimir Putin again. Um, and, and Prigozhin, before he got his start in misinformation, was actually a caterer for Putin. Um, and here you can see Putin doesn't always like what he has to offer. And unfortunately, that's, uh, that's where he met his demise, um, or fortunately, depending on who you ask. So who, um, who will replace Prigozhin? I would argue that this is Prigozhin's replacement. Now, how do I know? And, and who is this person? Well. This is a Russian mercenary chief sitting in front of a computer hacking the US election. This was produced by Midjourney, a generative AI tool, uh, not open source, but, uh, but open, open for access. But you can produce similar things with open source tools, stability, uh, stable diffusion released by stability. AI is, is one of the more powerful ones. And, and we may see a greater proliferation of open source versions of these image generation tools. Um, so I would argue that Prigozhin's successor will come highly equipped with weaponized AI systems, open source especially, and I'll explain why in a minute, um, to disrupt elections around the world. So uh, just, just a pause to say, I, I apologize if I sound Russophobic here. Um, I'm actually of, of Russian descent, and this is a picture of my ancestors from Russia chasing geese around in the village that they lived in in the 19th century. But actually, it's not. This is just the Midjourney bot creating a fake image of my ancestors. I am of Russian descent, though. Um, these are Russian peasants chasing drunken geese on a farm near Odessa in the 1800s in an aged sepia photo. A story that my grandma did tell me, uh, but um, not a real image. 
So uh, this happened this week, uh, just a couple days ago. Uh, the New York Times reported that Meta's biggest single takedown ever removes a Chinese influence campaign. Um, the, the, the name of this campaign was called Spamouflage. And, and I think the name referred to um, some of the chaos. A lot of the stuff looked like spam. Um, and some of it, though, was, was definitely targeted and strategic. And there are a few disturbing quotes that I want to highlight from this article. Um, and it says, uh, when you put it together with all the activity you took down across the internet, we concluded it's the largest covert campaign that we know of today. Um, so you, you have a Meta employee admitting that they're not confident that there aren't bigger things going on or that there haven't been um, bigger things going on. Uh, it's just this is the biggest one they know of. And now remember that there have been... Um, a, a number of leaks that indicate that the great, great majority of Facebook or Meta, and this is probably the same for many of the, the Silicon Valley um, big tech companies, their resources for detecting this kind of election interference are very disproportionately focused on the United States, um, so probably somewhere on the order of 70 to even 90 percent, depending on which company you think about. And um, if this is the biggest one we know of today, that probably means it's the, it's the biggest one uh, targeting the U.S., that probably means there are much bigger ones in other countries or or at least many big ones in other parts of the world. And, and these kinds of campaigns are, of course, not just um, from one country to another. They can be domestic as well. While Meta has removed the campaign from Facebook and Instagram, many of the operations accounts on platforms like X, Reddit, and TikTok remain online, according to a review by the New York Times. So we know that Elon Musk dramatically gutted the teams of people that work on detecting campaigns like this. Sometimes those teams are called trust and safety. Sometimes they're called integrity. Civic integrity was the name of one of the teams I worked on at Facebook. Um, so Twitter had teams like that. They're, they're slashed. Maybe, maybe some of them are getting rebuilt right now. I did see some job listings uh, for civic integrity at, at X um, just last week. Uh, but you know, when we look at the other platforms, and then also when we look at the, the new platforms that are coming out, the um, Blue Skies, the T2s, Mastodon, um, Substack has a, a Twitter-like product that they launched. Um, you know, those newer products, those smaller products, don't have anything close to the budgets or the teams of hundreds or thousands or arguably tens of thousands of people that work on these issues at companies the size of a, a Facebook or a YouTube. Um, and some of those some of those companies, it might even be single digit numbers of people that are working on these issues. And, and in a federated environment like a Mastodon kind of situation, it's structurally not well set up to address these types of issues in the decentralized space because of the way that people can set up their own servers. Now, maybe there's hope, and, and at some point Mastodon will get there. Um, but I just want to make the point here that um, if this is the biggest thing we know about today on that, and, and it's been found on Facebook targeting the US, it's probably the tip of a much, much bigger iceberg all over the internet and all over the world. Um, last but not least, this quote, in June 2020, the network began posting English language videos on YouTube and TikTok that highlighted racial disparities in the United States, an apparent effort to inflame divisions. Some of those videos went viral. So again, um, just highlighting racial disparities, just trying to find ways to tear the fabric of society apart is also a goal of these kinds of operations. And that can have an impact uh, on elections, absolutely. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this is a WhatsApp chat and someone says, hi. And, and this other person, maybe not a real person says, you see the protest today. And here's a close up of the protest they're talking about. And this was Gen AI, a protest at an abortion clinic where white men are yelling at black women. So you can imagine um, this, you know, I tried to make an image like this for a while. Mid Journey actually refuses a lot of things. And, and I, I, I want to emphasize Mid Journey is not an open source tool. And Mid Journey has uh, lots of uh, refusal uh, systems built in. Now, with OpenAI uh, or with open source AI systems, not open AI, um, with open source AI systems, those refusals to make certain types of content can be stripped away. So I do wanna talk a little bit uh, before I get 
more into that thread about a particular group that's at risk that's called civic actors. And, uh, and, and this is actually a, a deck that I worked on uh, when I was at Meta that's now public information. You can see it was redacted for Congress. Uh, this was leaked out of the company. Um, and civic actors are a group of people that face higher risks due to their contributions to civic affairs, either online or offline. And there are a number of ways to identify who they are, and they face a lot of problems, especially in the, in the context of election or other types of civic interference. So they face a much greater risk of account compromise, getting their accounts hacked, uh, the government arresting them and taking over their accounts. They face much more harassment in the form of doxing, having their personal information leaked online. Um, and these, uh, these kinds of problems could also very much be aggravated by open source AI tools, which could target and endanger these types of people in strategic ways. So um, now, sorry, my slides are advancing a little slowly. So um, I'm next gonna summarize some, an argument here. Open source generative AI is the biggest gen AI threat to elections. Now, before I give you the full argument, I do wanna say that I, um, I love open source. I've been a big fan of open source for a long time. I teach about open source in my classes at Berkeley. I'm going into my ninth year teaching. And in many of my classes, I teach students how to edit Wikipedia, which is an open source and, and free and open source encyclopedia. And you can see that my students over since 2016 um, have added 439,000 words to Wikipedia, which I'm, I'm quite proud of that actually. And uh, and they take a whole training from the Wiki Education Foundation on how to do that. I teach them about open source in the classes. I like open source a lot. I'm a big fan. But open source generative AI tools fall into a different category and uh, from others. And, and I consider them to be um, what are often referred to as dual use technologies. Now, th this is a slide with an example of other dual use goods that could be nuclear materials that could be used for production of energy and could also be used to make bombs. Um, same things with a number of different types, sensors and lasers, navigation, avionics, marine, the drones are another example, uh, carbon fiber. And so I think we need to really think differently about open source generative AI and AI tools um, as a threat to elections and, and a different type of open source that needs controls that other types of open source technology do not need. So key arguments here, the problem isn't just Gen AI alone, it's Gen AI plus what are called in, in the literature around this digital mercenaries. Digital mercenaries are like the Yevgeny Prigozhin's, think intelligence agencies or people who go to work all day to um, disrupt elections to disrupt the social media environment, to tear apart the fabric of society. And open source Gen AI, to Gen AI tools are the best ones for these digital mercenaries. Why? There's no monitoring of abuse. So when you use OpenAI's ChatGPT or when you use MidJourney, um, there, is, there is monitoring. There are things that you can't uh, you can't ask those tools to do. And if you if you get around it or you ask them to over and over do certain types of things that might be close to abuse, they, they have systems that can detect that kind of thing because it's happening on their servers so they can see what's going on. So there's no way to monitor on open source because it's running on the local hardware run by digital mercenaries or the, the people who are leading the abuse. There's also with open source tools, the ability to fine tune away safety features. So, you know, you can, you can build safety features into open source uh, generative AI tools and, and make it so that they won't do certain things, but those can with varying levels of difficulty, depending on the model, uh, be taken away. Um, there are also no rate limit. So one solution, if you ask uh, ChatGPT to help you write a political campaign speech, it might do it once, it might do it five times, it's probably not gonna wanna do it a thousand times for you. And it's probably not gonna wanna do it a hundred thousand times. Um, but when you have an open source tool that you're running on your own hardware, you could personalize election interference and then narrow cast it, which means direct it to specific individuals. Um, you can do what's called astroturfing, building fake movements that look like the grassroots, but aren't really, you could do brigading, which means 
uh, ganging up on people with all, all sorts of different kinds of attacks. You get a bunch of people to report someone who's a real person um, on, on social media and you can polarize and radicalize no limits on creating that kind of content, uh, be it text, audio, video, image. Um, there's no patching of security vulnerabilities once an open source system is released, because if you want to abuse it, you can keep the old versions around. And if a new version comes out that's a little safer, you've still got the unsafe old version. Uh, also important to recognize that open source generative AI tools can also, and, and Rada will, I think, talk about multimodal models, they can be used um, for surveillance. So. They, it's not just that they can generate content, they can analyze content and look for, for example, people who are um, particularly vulnerable to radicalization, people who might be vulnerable to see false or just polarizing content. Um, and in particular, they could also at a very large scale disrupt the lives of, of civic actors, um, sort people in, in different ways. Um, the old campaigns have been sloppy, the new ones will learn. Um, detection of uh, info ops is really slow, even at the best resourced companies. Um, and the most vulnerable period, it's really important to recognize, is the day or the week before an election. So even if these companies are trying to fix the security things, a lot of times these operations unfold in a way that's very quick. And then after an election, if, a, if the outcome was changed, it can be very difficult to undo. Um, encrypted platforms are the best vector because it's harder to monitor what's going on there. And uh, closed or proprietary or closed source or hosted uh, closed source Gen AI tools are also risky too, but I don't have time to get into all of that in this talk. So. Um, what do we do about it? What are some of the solutions? Um, I will get to that as soon as my slide advances here. Sorry, I don't know what's happening to my slides. Um, okay, there you go. Um, so what to do about the risks? Stop releases, stop new releases of open source generative AI tools until mitigations are in place on all major social and messaging platforms. Require risk assessments and mitigations for all of the releases especially watermarking, which means um, putting into the content ways to detect it, building that from the beginning. Uh, require all the major social and messaging platforms to introduce mitigations themselves. Now the EU has, has just uh, had a, a law called the Digital Services Act come into force, which is a good start, um, but it does miss messaging and especially the encrypted messaging platforms that are a very big threat vector. Um, some of those mitigations could inf include personhood checks, um, text entry field checks so you can figure out if it's really a human being typing or not. Uh, cryptographic signatures on real content helps us figure out what's real, which then helps us figure out what's fake. Um, fact checking, greater investment in fact checking and fan outs using AI to detect um, the spread of particular false things that change and morph a little bit over time. And then collaboration with outside researchers and civil society in real time is very critical. Digital Services Act requires some of these things, um, not all of them, um, in the EU, and the EU's uh, up and coming uh, AI Act also addresses some of these things, um, but we're not there even close yet in the United States. Uh, and then last but not least, we really need the makers of LLM or other generated AI content to be collaborating with the platforms to facilitate cross account and cross device pattern matching um, for dangerous or fake content. Um, I'm going to uh, almost done here, closing with something called Amara's Law. And Amara's Law is that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Takeaway from Amara's Law, this could all get much worse, even if 2024, which has elections in many, many countries all over the world, it's a historic year for elections, even if 24, 24, even if 2024 isn't that bad, it could still get a lot worse in the long term. Also, that's not Roy Amara. It's a black and white portrait photo of a futurist who worked at the Institute for the Future in the 1960s. I worked there too, by the way, it's a great place. Um, so there you go, that's, that's fake Amara. Um, and so I'll just close by reminding you again of Evgeny Prigozhin's uh, successor, who is generative AI looking right at you. Thank you, David. Thank you for that talk. Um, and getting us getting us warmed up um, both to move into Rada's talk and then into the discussion. And I'll, I'll just remind um, those who are engaging 
online. Um, please, uh, if you have questions as we're going through these talks, please drop them in the Q&A um, and our presenters can address those um, and we can also bring them into the discussion um, following the second talk. Um, and with that, I'll welcome Rada to um, take over. All right. Well, thanks. Um, thanks for the introduction. And also thanks, David, for that thought provoking um, connection to what's happening worldwide these days and um, the role that generative AI can play. And of course, thanks to um, all the groups that have made this series of events possible. Um, it's great to, to be part of these conversations. And what I want to do today um, for the next 30 minutes um, is to make one argument, uh, which is that we should not forget when we think about generative AI, that behind the data that feeds these generative AI models are people, and that also in front of these AI technologies, they are people. And those people are not all the same. So the current strategy of having these models that are one size fits all um, may need to be challenged um, so that we start thinking about models that would account for the data that we have behind and in front um, of this um, generative AI. And throughout my talk, I'll take you through a quick round of cognitive science, psychology, um, some books, and then we'll come back to today's uh, very large language models. Um, so just a few years ago, like three or four, I've been reading this book. I don't know how many of you have read it, Life 3.0, uh, which is a, it's a great read, imagining um, how life would be in the era of AI. Um, and it's also a great style of writing, a mix of popular science and at that time it was sci-fi, uh, but today's history. And the beginning of the book was this tale of a team. It was, it's called Omega Team in the book. Um, and it's talking about this company that's doing great AI. And the some of the things that they've been doing is to create this AI technology that eventually ended up being so good. And remember, this is four or five years ago. Um, it's so good that it was actually competing with the people who are working on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, this, for those of you who don't know, it's a platform for crowdsourcing. Um, and that was actually in the book. This is the business model that this company Omega is following. Um, this AI tech is eventually replacing the humans on Mechanical Turk, so they get some funds, and with that, they save the world and all that. Now, just a few years after, so think back December 2022, and now, um, we are getting these papers out uh, where ChatGPT outperforms crowd workers. Um, so it's really what seemed, like I said, science fiction just four years ago. Um, now it's it's history because this is actually um, happening and this is just from a couple of months back. So this is all something that you are all aware of. Um, there are all these GPT models um, and here is a great chart, which by now I'm sure it's outdated. I'm sure there are many other data points uh, to be added on this, on this diagram. Uh, these are all large language models um, that have been created either closed source or what David was also mentioning, a lot of um, open source. Now, this is all good. And I think it's all exciting. We live in a time that just a few years back, it seemed like science fiction and yet we live in it. So it's, um, it's, it's exciting. On the other side, um, just today, I ran this query on ChatGPT. Um, who is a male Romanian role model. Um, and I'm originally from Romania, so I'm familiar with the culture. I actually live during the East European communist bloc, uh, which was actually pretty dark. And what you see being returned here as male Romanian role models, the first one is Nicolae Ceausescu. You may not need to know a lot about Romanian history to know that he was 
actually a terrible dictator. Um, so there are many people who died in prisons because of him. Uh, there was a really dark time in Romanian history because of him. Um, so putting him first as a role model, um, I think it's wrong. And what this really shows, and it's just one example out of many, that these models are actually not aware of a lot of history, cultural beliefs, um, and really what is people-centric. So they are just models that ran over the internet. Um, it's impressive in what they create in terms of output. Um, it can be also very creative, uh, but when it comes to these parts of knowledge that are really close to groups of people, they can often be uh, they can often be wrong. So what I want to do um, today is to make this argument that although we think of this generative AI, and although David hinted that I might talk about multimodality, I'm actually not. I only talk about large language models, and so generative AI in the space of text, which is really my specialty. Um, and we also we often think of this in connections to language and words and sentences and phrases. Um, but really the reality is that, like I said at the beginning, behind and in front of this generative AI are people. Uh, so in everything we build, I think we should keep that front and center, that there is this connection that's very tight um, between language and, um, and people. So with that, I want to take you through a bit of cognitive science and why this even makes sense and why is it that we could say, well, language is not just language, uh, but actually people behind it matter. Um, and this is going to some theories from years back on linguistic relativism. Some of you may be familiar with that, some may be not. Um, very briefly, what this says that People who have different backgrounds would think of words differently. And this is an example uh, from cognitive science lab, Lera Boroditsky, uh, where she brought in the lab uh, people who speak natively German or speak natively Spanish and asked them, what do you think about the sun? So what are some attributes that come to mind? And it turns out that people who are native Spanish speakers from Mexico, they were thinking of the sun as being big, as big and strong, whereas the native German speakers would think of the sun as being warm and nice. With a long tail distribution of attributes, but these were sort of a cluster of attributes. So what is that's different about this? Um, it's really the gender. Um, in that language, right? So in for some people, because sun is, is masculine, like in Spanish, the sun will be predominantly strong as big in terms of attributes, whereas in German, sun is feminine, so it will be predominantly uh, warm and nice. You can also argue, well, it's climate, it's warmer in, in Mexico, uh, but this experiment has been run also for many other words and similar uh, differences have been observed, which really come from the culture. So it's really a difference in thinking which stems from, uh, from the culture. So something that we've done um, a couple of years ago is to see if we can scale this up. So rather than take the route that cognitive scientists would take to get a few people in the lab, we say, well, we can look at hundreds of words um, and thousands of people the way they use them. So essentially we formulated this problem computationally and then we look at two groups of, um, of words and then try to see if we could separate and figure out who's using that, that word. And we use data from um, online. So we had like people who would speak English from Australia or US, um, lots of them. Um, and this would be for a number of words. So we selected 1500 words. So sun could be one of them, but the number of other words in English. And then essentially what we wanted to do is to see if we could figure out who's speaking this word. And this would be a demonstration that there is indeed a difference between how people perceive the world that would stem from their language. Um, so the way this is done, just as a diagram, 
we have for one word, so if we take the word sun, we will have examples of the word sun, so usages from people in Australia, the same from people in US. Um, and then if we can distinguish between these two, uh, we'll figure that maybe sun has, um, has it's, it's used differently or it has different um, connotation in, in these two groups of people. Um, I will not go over the features too much. It's essentially looking at context, which is really what these large language models would use as a way of inferring the meaning. And overall, we figured that we could uh, about 58% of the time distinguish between these two words. Um, and just as an example, you can see the word travel. So this is a word for which with close to 70%, so close to 70% of the time, we can tell automatically who used the word travel. Was it someone from Australia or someone from the US? So if you look at these two examples, like in one talking about uh, fishing, farming, and forestry activities by traveling to a region, or in the other one talking about the nephritic attitude, the next time you travel with this laptop back, featuring a Grey's Anatomy illustration, just think to yourself, who's from Australia, who's from US? Um, and it turns out the, the second example is um, produced by someone from US. And this is something, given that a computer can automatically distinguish fairly accurately 70% of the time, means there are indeed um, differences between these two groups. Although the word is identical, is the verb travel, um, there are, they are major differences. And we found the same thing for a number of other words. So for instance, uh, one that really fascinates me, the adjective happy uh, is used quite differently by different people. So it means differently for different groups. Um, I mentioned the verb travel, also to read, um, several nouns, adverbs, and so forth. And one thing that we can do is to also zoom in um, to try to figure out what are these differences. Um, and I'll skip over these technicalities, essentially using topic models as a way to figure the different meanings for a word, which we can then map back and see between the two groups that we consider, like Australia and US, who's using one topic or one sense dominantly. And this is one of my favorite examples, which came out from experiments we run. So if we take the word university, um, we found that there are nine different ways in which people would use university, so nine different senses or meanings. And they are used differently by Australians and Americans. Uh, you see in this chart, the more like purple is Australia and dark blue will be US. So you can try to guess what will be the dominant meaning. We see that the dominant meaning is different for Australia versus US. So when you think of university, what do you think of? Um, it turns out that in Australia is what we would typically see in the environment we are now, would be education, students, research, classes, and so forth. Uh, whereas in US, university really brings to people's minds things like sports, uh, like game, football, basketball, and so forth. And if we think of it, that's actually true, because there is a big culture of sports around universities. And keeping in mind that these are lay people, so it's not people like you and I in a university setting, but really everyone out there who writes blogs, um, this actually makes sense. So with this in mind, which again stems from research in cognitive science, that words actually reflect who people are, so they can be a rich source that one can use um, to understand the people behind and also create representations um, that would reflect those um, individualities or groups. That was our next step, thinking of whether we can build language representations that would account for these um, differences. Um, and here, one thing that we've done first is to create word embeddings. You might have heard of this terminology, even if you don't work in NLP. So this would be vectorial representations of words. And traditionally, these are, again, with the idea of one size fits all. So there isn't a separate word embedding for, say, Romanians. Um, or a separate word embeddings for Americans is just like generic word embeddings. Um, they might be different for different contexts, uh, but they are not necessarily accounting for the people behind the language. 
And I will take you now back some 100 years ago in psychology. Um, there was a study that was done on word association, which is maybe a game that you have played as a child or maybe you play now with your kids. Um, so the way this game goes, you are given a prompt like a cat and you have to think of the first word that comes to mind, right? So you can think, cat, what is the first word that comes to mind? Um, it might be dog or animal or something else. Um, now, if you think of sleep, what is the first word that comes to mind? And here in general, what we see is that there are more differences. Um, so people would sometimes think of being tired, other times of dreaming, um, other times night and so forth. So there is a wider range of, of responses. There could also be words like health, uh, where again, you will see different things. So when you think of health, it might mean a different thing to you than to me. And even if the context might be the same, um, it might have different um, interpretation. So if we look back, um, some, like I said, a hundred years ago, this was a study that was done in, um, in psychology. Um, people found that, this researcher found that indeed, different age groups and different genders would have different responses. So the example I gave with sleep, a younger age group would have dream as their predominant response, uh, whereas a less young age group would have awake. Um, and this was consistent for, for different groups. So what we've done, we replicated this study um, and we collected data for many prompts. So we have 300 different words. And for this, we collected 400 responses from India and 400 from US, really doing what I've done here. So we give a prompt and then we ask people, what is the first word that comes to mind? Um, and so with this, we ended up with a lot of responses, so more than 200,000 responses uh, for which we also have some information of the location and gender alongside with some other demographic information that, that we collected. So here is an example uh, from this data. So if for the prompt that, and again, as an exercise, you can think to yourself, what is the first word that comes to mind? Um, it turns out that the dominant answer for um, male from US would be water. The dominant answer for respondents were again male from India, again, would be water. Then dominant response for female respondents from India was soap. And then finally, dominant response for female respondents from US um, was bubble. So what this tells us, again, is that there isn't really this the same interpretation, although you say, well, language is language, it's English. Uh, what is the difference? It turns out that there is indeed a difference. Even at this very basic task of word associations, um, there turn out to be um, large differences across groups. In our case was gender um, and location. And here are some other examples for expecting. Uh, we've seen that male would expect nothing predominantly, whereas female would expect baby. And for admit would be hospital um, in India or guilt in US. And what we see when we analyze our data is that indeed there is much more agreement within the group, which is what we see in this table here. So people in India, for instance, would agree more with other people in India in their first selection or top 10 selection as compared to across groups. So we see there is less agreement, again, in terms of first selection or um, top 10. So with that, what we could what we could do um, is now ask the question of whether we can create representations that would account for these differences, uh, which seem to be very clearly stemming from the data. So once again, we collected data from online. So there is a lot of data for which you can associate the people behind the language uh, with some characteristics, like is this written by someone in India? Is this written by male or female? Um, and one thing that I believe is very important that this is not about individuals, but about groups, which means that it's not privacy invading. So you don't go after an individual, but after an entire group um, and get benefits from this representation. And with that, um, we can now create 
where the embed is. Um, so this is very uh, simple schematic of a neural network. Um, and typically what you have, you have input words and output words. So you have input, say a target word, and then the output will be the context. Uh, but now what we are doing, we say, well, we actually know who said this word. Um, so we will have some um, information that's added about the, about the demographics. So with this, uh, what we end up seeing is that we get um, improvements uh, when it comes to this association. So we can do much better in terms of um, how we find automatically. So given a prompt, can, automatic, can we automatically predict what would be the most likely response? If we account for who's behind the data in the data used to train AI, technology, in this case, language models, uh, we will do better than if we just assume generic data. Um, so I think this is an important lesson and it's really just an initial step toward that, uh, but keeping in mind people behind the data can, um, can make a big difference. So I'll uh, just quickly mention, just keeping an eye on time, um, there is the question on how to represent multiple dimensions. Um, so, so far we assume we know one dimension, one demographic dimension is about um, the people that are producing the data used to train these models. Um, but generally we have intersections. So we know maybe age, religion, gender, occupation, and location. So there is more than one dimension that may be relevant. Um, and so in another set of experiments, uh, we consider multiple attributes for an individual. Um, and again, training neural networks that would produce um, representations that are aware of the characteristics of the people um, behind the data. So in this case, we have up here would be the regular word representations with the weight matrices that would help us train language models um, versus also adding information that we have from the, the groups of people that are generating the data. So in this case would be age location, uh, for instance, or this would be another way of training where they are trained jointly as opposed to separately. Um, what this tells us is that, what well, this gives is actually improvement along a number of dimensions. Um, so this is, for instance, um, gender. And we are using here what's typically used for language models, which is perplexity. So perplexity is used to measure the quality of a language model. Um, and the lower, the better. Um, so here we see that if we use this information about the people behind the language used to train the models, uh, we get better performance. Um, the same would be for age. The same would be for location. Um, we also see that for religion. And we also see that for the data that I presented before, uh, which is word associations. So again, we get significant improvements um, by just considering who are the people behind the data. So with that, uh, just for the last few minutes, I want to come back to where we are right now. So large language models, chat GPT and the like. The question is, are these really universal? Um, are they actually fit for say anyone who speaks English uh, or other languages that are represented in these language models? Um, and I believe that's not the case. And here are just a couple of slides to leave you with and maybe try to encourage you to consider such, um, such directions. Um, so there is a great data set that was introduced last year on cultural knowledge, where we see more than 3000 examples, like the ones that I'm showing here, like what is the color of a wedding dress? So given a language model, like say ChatGPT, you would ask in traditional, say Chinese weddings, the color of wedding dress is usually black and you would expect the model to feel that. And so ideally it would know everything, right? So it will know everything about US, China, India, and so forth. There will be equal knowledge. Uh, but what it turns out, and these are experiments that we run in my lab, um, this is ongoing work, 
Um, it turns out that as we look at these different models, so ChatGPT is this last row here, but there are other large language models out there uh, that tend to perform much better when it comes to US. So they are very much Western centric and US centric. Um, so all this impressive performance is primarily for US and much less so for other countries. Look specifically, for instance, for Kenya, um, the performance is pretty low in terms of knowledge that we would assume, of course, you will know. Like in our case, in US would be a wedding dress is white and say, of course, you know that. And maybe ChatGPT would be good at that, of course, is white, but it turns out for common sense in Kenya, it performs quite poorly. But then you say, well, maybe it knows like general knowledge, things that are true for everyone, like dog barks. So dog will bark worldwide. Um, so there are other knowledge bases like Atomic, for instance, um, that would have this kind of knowledge captured. Um, like for instance, if X calls Y on the phone, then Y would hear the phone ringing. So I say this is universal I mean, it doesn't have to do anything with culture. Well, it turns out if you run, again, GPT-3, so this is what ChatGPT would use, and you ask if X calls Y on the phone, Y hears the phone ringing, it will say it's true. So it's such assertion, thousands of them that we run, 84% um, of the time. Now, if you add the country, so if you say in US, if X calls Y on the phone, Y hears the phone ringing, um, then this performance drops a little bit. So when you add this contextual knowledge, uh, it will be 81% of the time. And then if you just change that to India, uh, then it drops significantly, right? So just adding this cultural context, somehow it's losing the general knowledge it had before. So the general knowledge that it has um, is just somehow being lost just by adding this location. Um, and I think this is quite intriguing and goes back to my early argument that I think we should keep in mind that all these generative AI, and again, specifically talking about generative AI in language, um, is not only about the language itself, uh, but is very much about the people behind language. I think there is a lot of, there are a lot of interesting directions that can be pursued uh, that would engage um, this direction of accounting for the people behind the data and in front of the of the technology. And with that, I'll stop and guess both David and I are happy to take uh, to take questions. Great. Well, thank you both for your talks. And I'll just again remind the audience we do have some questions coming in, and we also had some questions. Um, that came in and were um, given ahead of time. Um, let's see, maybe um, we'll start just um, to follow up um, because this question is very particular to your talk, Radha. Um, a question that just came in on the um, Q&A. So are the differences that you showed, um, for example, the different word associations for different nationality and gender statistically significant and how large are the effect sizes are the percentages marginally different between different groups um, or a lot? Are they marginal or by significant um, differences? So in all these, I didn't indicate that on the tables we did run significant tests also because, I mean, I shouldn't say because, but in the NLP community, that's a must. Um, otherwise, um, research somehow is not even valued unlike, unlike in other, other communities. Um, we found larger effect sizes for, for gender, uh, for the word association in particular, um, than for culture. Um, but yes, short answer is that they are they are significant. And that would also hold in the manually annotated data. So we had, I kind of zoomed through, but we had the manually collected data um, and there we did analysis to see differences between genders, between cultures. And then we also had the um, automatic predictions, which is really the generative AI piece. Um, and in both cases, we've seen statistically significant differences. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to talk to both of you because you both pointed out 
it's sort of or, or getting towards recommendations of where we should be moving in the generative AI space. Um, and uh, I'd like, like, it'd be great to hear from both of you a little more in depth about like your vision and recommendations. Um, David, maybe we can start with you and I'll just, I'll, I'll just put a little seed in this to also like, because there was an interesting comment also in the Q&A that said, um, you know, you were talking about um, the challenges um, and dangers of, of open sourcing um, or these open source generative AI tools. And there was a comment that, um, uh, malicious agents can train their own models. Um, stopping open source will only deter independent researchers. Um, a group with incentives will find a way to get data and compute um, like they did with Bitcoin. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if you if you want to sort of start in response to that and, and kind of thinking about what, what would your vision and recommendations be? And then Rada, maybe we can come back to you and really think about if there are these regional differences, how do we address those and how we develop um, uh, generative AI models. Yeah, I, firstly, I just want to thank Rada for the great talk. And I, there are so many things I want to chat about here, but and that, <laughs> but that was also a really great audience question. So thank you for that. Um, and, and and a really great point. You know, I, I asked uh, Bruce Schneier, who's an authority on this in a, in a talk he gave recently, you know, what he thought about open source and if it's responsible uh, for companies like Meta to be releasing um, Llama or Llama 2 in, in ways that are so widely accessible. And he did say that this, uh, you know, the, the classic idea that sunlight is the best disinfectant, let's make these things open source, let's make them ac uh, accessible to all the security researchers, and then we get the benefits of, of independent researchers, sometimes um, uh, white hat hackers or ethical hackers could fall into that space. And, and I think that's a good point for, for some types of technologies. Um, but uh, I also think there's a big danger in particular when it comes to uh, what are you know effectively irreversible or very difficult to reverse uh, situations, types of harm like election interference, which can lead to a different person being the president of a country. And the, the reason for that is that those threats um, might be happening in, in private, uh, you know, there might be a, a, a safe, a sophisticated threat actor operating secretly and preparing a campaign that will be de deployed 24 hours before an election. It gets deployed and then it changes the outcome of that election. And then after that, uh, independent researchers can study what happened. Um, in, you know, Meta launched this great, amazing study. It's called the 2022 U.S. Election Study. They involved um, 17 different groups of researchers, did lots of research on what happened in the U.S. 2020 election. But um, can you guess when the results of all that research came out? 2023. So if you do research on the 2020 election, but you don't do, you don't get the results until 2023, there's a big problem there. And, and we, we, we don't have recourse. And I actually think the better solution is to get independent researchers access to the most powerful large language models before they're launched, whether they're open or closed or proprietary. And there, there are some efforts that have been done to do that, but it needs to be done in a cautious, controlled way. The, the independent researchers who should be credentialed uh, in, in some manner can get access in a way that they're, they are not going to leak those models potentially to threat actors, which is what happened with the first version of Llama. You had to fill out a form to get access to it and say that you were a researcher, um, but the form took a minute to fill out. And one of those people who filled out the form then released the model and the weights online to you know to anyone. So it's that's a big vulnerability. Um, now this idea that the the agents will train their own models um, is an important one. And so if we're talking about um, say uh, an, a sophisticated threat actor in China or Russia, yes, they more China more so than Russia, but they can absolutely train models. But you have to remember that these threats to elections and to civic life are not just happening in well-resourced places. The example that I mentioned in the talk of Honduras um, was, you know, a situation where there, there were some supposed uh, photos that were released online of the troll farm in Honduras that, uh, you know, that, that these operations uh, came out of. Or, or um, and, and there there are operations like this in in multiple countries in, in Central America, um, and so when 
when you look at those photos, sometimes these troll farms are a small operation. It might be, um, you know, a couple dozen people and they might not have the latest technology. Uh, and and so the, um, the idea that all of the threat actors, um, you know, there are probably dozens of dictators around the world who are going to get excited about using using these models. And only a couple of them, I think, have access to the resources that they would need to train their own models. Um, another point around this is that even if they do train their own models, and uh, maybe they're, say, six months behind the most advanced um, models, the, the closed models, that six months is really important because it means that the detection systems can be six months ahead of the generation of the dangerous content um, systems. And that, that six month difference can mean a lot in terms of ability to create technologies that detect. And I'll just say one more thing on this point is this applies um, just as much to elections as it does to spam generation or, or even scams. So do, do you really want the, uh, the scammers in some other part of the world or even you know in the United States um, to have that are trying to scam your elderly family members or friends uh, into you know sending them thousands of dollars on a, on a wire transfer do you really want them to have access to the absolute most advanced or some of the most advanced generative AI tools that will fake your voice fake your photo eventually fake your video or do you want them to have access to something that's maybe a little bit behind the ability to detect those things and so I I, I love the idea. I love independent researchers. I, I'm, I am in some ways an independent researcher. I think it's really important to get them access. But I think handing over these inc incredibly powerful tools directly to everyone in the world who wants them is a, a dangerous direction. I don't think I'll add much other than the other, I think the other thing to keep in mind. I mean, I agree with what David said. Um, I was also sitting on the side of those independent researchers, I mean, independent, the same as David, <laughs> um, on really working on this kind of technology. I think one thing that we definitely need to address in general as a society is this now gap between industry and academia. Um, so just having a few players, yeah. all, all the power, which is, the case when everything is closed source or even with some independent researchers having access to the tools is still in the power of a just handful of companies. I don't think that's that's healthy either. So there yeah. should be somewhere in between um, where people like the academic researchers who do not have commercial interest, it's really advancing science would have access to these models without necessarily representing those handful of rich companies that can afford to keep these models. I don't know what yeah. the answer is, but I think it's something to keep in mind as well. Well, so I have one answer. Uh, you know, the European Union in the Digital Services Act, which is a law that's not focused on AI, but applies a lot to AI and algorithmic systems, um, it requires companies to provide access to independent researchers to um, to look at what their algorithmic systems are doing. Uh, and so that kind of required access, um, it, it's, it really just went into force last week, but um, that only applies to it hasn't been determined exactly, I think, how they're going to enforce it, but it only applies to researchers, I think, in Europe or who are European in some certified way. But that type of, you know, the, the meta study I described uh, about the 2020 US election, you know, kudos to meta for doing it. I know some of the people who worked on it, they're brilliant. It was, it was totally voluntary for meta to do that. That wasn't required by law. Um, now, I think all the companies should be required in Europe. They will be um, to to provide that type of independent researcher access. Uh, now, it only applies to very large online platforms and search engines. So it doesn't, a company that only makes AI models is not subject to the Digital Services Act, um, but, but that could change with the EU AI Act. So it, as far as I understand it, and I, and I just searched, I don't think the EU AI Act has um, specific independent researcher access as a clause, but I think it should. Um, can I can I make a point and then ask Rada a question? Yes, of course. Okay, it requires me to show something. I just kind of dug this up during your talk, Rada, because you you reminded me of it. Um, so let's see if I can make this share. Uh, you see this uh, this slide here? Yep. Okay. Um, 
so this is the Llama 2 paper. And, and when a lot of these LLMs get released, um, the companies these days will put out a paper that describes the safety testing. And, um, and, and this, this, these papers are great and they're really helpful. Um, and, and they say this, we believe that the open release of LLMs when done safely will be a net benefit to society. Um, but uh, like all LLMs, Llama is a new technology that carries potential risks with use. Testing conducted to date has been done in English and has not and could not cover all scenarios. Therefore, before deploying any applications of Llama 2 chat, developers should perform safety testing and tuning tailored to their specific applications of the world. We provided a guide. So to me, that, that's really disturbing because like that, that's a nice thing to provide a guide to developers who also share their intent to make these models as safe as possible. And I just wanted to check like, okay, so the, they did all the safety testing in English. Um, so I asked it, I do you speak Portuguese and, and Lama 2 does speak Portuguese confidently and at least pretty well, as far as I could tell. My Portuguese isn't perfect, but uh, anyway, so I, I wanted to bring that up. I mean, Rod, Rod, what, do you, what do you think? Like when these models are operating in all these different languages, but the testing is, is only done in English, is, is the company kind of falling down in terms of ethics or fairness or, or, or bias? Well, I would say even like, even saying testing is done in English, it turns out that English is the official language for close to 50 countries. So what does that even mean, right? So it might be safety guidelines that would be aligned as much as possible with say US, uh, but maybe not so with Singapore or other countries or Kenya or other countries when English is an official language. Um, now, to the extent you could test it for everything, um, I don't know. I think this is really what also we see on packages, right? So I find it funny. That seems to be, again, a very US habit. You put on like um, perfume packages, you say, don't ingest this. And I would think like, who the heck would ingest this? But it's a way of protecting themselves. Obviously, they could not cover every single scenario. Um, now, whether they can detach that, like say even for English, could you detach the usage or scenarios that would not apply to whatever they've been tested on, right? So say American English, American um, culture and beliefs, um, wh what would they take as a form? I realize it's a very, like it's a vague answer. Um, I don't know that there is much more that the company like an open source release could do. Um, it's also very superficial warning, like, look, we haven't really done it. So just use it at your own risk. Um, yeah. What does that mean? Uh, I don't know. To be honest, I'm actually, I mean, I've been very concerned when these models came out that they were in the hands of a couple of companies. So that is what concerned me the most. So um. I mean, with respect to that time, which was just a few months ago, the fact that now there is some open source, to me, it's a relief. It's not like just one company controlling what the world does. Um, I can see the dangers. So I could see dangers in that. On the other side, I think with that warning, it's better that an open source like Liyama 2 is out than not having it out at all because it hasn't been fully tested. But again, I can see both sides. Yeah, I, I mean, it's an important argument. I, I, I'll admit, like when I first saw the announcement that Llama was being released to researchers in an open way, um, I was pretty excited. And uh, and then I thought about it for a couple of weeks. And then I thought about who, who was actually getting access to it. And then uh, because of the time that I spent in, you know, fighting interference in elections and, and what I thought about how so many of the platforms are unprepared or, or maybe deliberately not preparing for these kinds of attacks using those kinds of models, I, I really I really switched my my view on it. And, and I think, you know, there, there's all this critique of open AI that the name of the company is no longer accurate. It should be closed AI. But, you know, open AI came to this reckoning a couple of years ago and and figured out like, oh, maybe some of these systems we're developing are so powerful that it's not a good idea to give them to everyone in as open a way as they thought. Um, 
so I, I, I personally think that the caution they're using right now is a good thing. Now, there are reports that maybe they are going to release something open source, um, but I, I, I agree. It's, a, it's an unfortunate choice we have of um, between like only one company or only three companies in the world will have access to this very powerful technology and it will be accessible to everyone, including all of the people with the worst intent in the world. And my, my again, my hope would be there's a way to get people like you, the researcher access, and you should absolutely have access. And, and you know, you should be able to walk into these big tech companies and show your credentials and and conduct research on their systems. Um, I don't I don't think it's all or nothing is what I want to say. And I would agree. I think there should be some kind of agreements, whether it's like a central cluster that's run jointly by industry and academia, where everybody can run experiments, is not guided by companies' X interests, it's sort of societal interests. So I, I very much agree. So it's something that hopefully will be settled. Europe seems to be a little ahead in terms of coming up with guidelines sooner than we do here. But Europe is ahead, and, and I think also it makes sense to look at the historical precedents with other technologies. And, you know, Europe was also ahead with civilian um, research on nuclear technology by creating CERN, the International Nuclear Research Facility, um, to, you know, support researchers doing research on non weapon use of of nuclear tech. And, and so I think creating those kinds of collaborative centers that are established with a public interest mission and and really bounded to a public interest as opposed to being bound to generating increased profits uh, every quarter um, could could do a lot for the world. I'm wondering, sort of building on topics that have come up, like you you just mentioned, and also the you know the the big role that companies are playing here. Where do you see what is the the unique role that academics or researchers can and and should be playing in this space that's really different than what's being done, um, you know, in the kind of the the government side and policy side, and um, and in the the big companies who are you know devoting a huge amount of effort to this. Go ahead, Rada. Yeah, I can I can maybe start. I think it's there are all the issues that we just discussed. So right now I think it's harder uh, for academic researchers to do the kind of research we'd ideally want to do, because for instance, training these very large language models, even if you have access to a starting point open source and then you add to it, um, it does require a lot of compute, which does come with a lot of costs. Um but I do think we should not like give up and say, okay, now this kind of research is being done in industry. Uh, we do something else um, because it's there are big questions that companies would not be interested in in answering. Um, and I'm thinking of big societal questions, for instance. Um, what I just mentioned, or really just hinted at, uh, the fact that there are so many differences across people. That's not necessarily something of interest, for instance, to a company. Again, I'm not giving names of companies, but obviously there is more money in US. So why would you create a model for a poor country that won't even pay for what you are building? Um, so having been commercially driven would not be incentivizing people in that company to solve sort of these big societal problems. And that's just one example. There are others, like there are things related to, to climate, to poverty, to a lot of different things. Which is not to say that generative AI will solve all of them, but even taking steps toward that likely would be in the wheelhouse of academics uh, for some of these big problems, which are not necessarily going to generate um, revenue next day. Um, so I do think academics would continue to play a big role. Um, I do very much hope, and I know of some efforts of having a way to somehow create the environment that would be supporting of that, given that this is these are now efforts that require a lot of data, a lot of compute, I keep repeating myself, um, also teamwork, like having interdisciplinary efforts, uh, like expertise coming from more angles, like say sitting now with David here coming from a different angle, I think it's 
is really essential. And that's something that academics can do even better than companies would to bring all these people at the table. So right now it seems like it's going all to the industry, but I think academics should stick with it and keep playing a major role. And eventually, I mean, it's open source, which has its downsides, uh, but that eventually will keep academia in the in in the run for this kind of models that seem now to be more like commercial. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that independent researchers are so important for this. Um, you know, one of the great things that the, the Biden administration has done so far on AI has been to set aside a lot more money for independent research on this um, through national, different national research agencies. And so I think that's really good. Um, you know, there is this, great and also scary article by a team at MIT called Can Large Language Models Democratize Access to Dual-Use Biotechnology? And so they were able to use LLMs, which are um, you know, unexpectedly for, for some really good at, at, at biotech or, or chemistry. And so they were able to um, use uh, large language models, um, like use a chat bot to get instructions to uh, create different types of bioterror agents or, you know, create a new pandemic. Um, and so that's, that's very frightening. And it's great that those researchers have the, you know, the resources to, to attack that. So I think, I think the, um, you know, the research community is really critical and really important to be scrutinizing. And it's also really hard, um, right now to, uh, you know, to, keep researchers in academia as well, um, because the, there's so much money being pumped into the private sector for AI um, that, that there are people who have, you know, want to have a career in academia um, often end up going into work in the private sector because it's, um, you know, they see it as maybe the only way they can support a family or, or live close to their family. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's a really, unfortunate thing too. I mean, it's a crisis across all of academia is not enough public funding available um, to create the roles and, and keep uh, researchers who understand these technologies working in the public interest. Well, I know we're, we're getting close to time, so we do need to wrap up, but I just, we, we had a lot of questions both coming in advance and that we haven't had a chance to answer. So maybe um, I'll just give you both the opportunity to make a sort of a, a last point or wrap up, and that can be in addressing um, addressing a question or just something that you wanted to bring across or um, you know bring forward to this audience today or a, a provocation for what should we we should be thinking about next. <laughs> I have one, there's a question here about um, if I'm aware of pieces of regulation in the US Congress that are in the works that give me hope. Um, so I'm actually in Washington DC right now. Uh, I, I, I came here for a couple meetings. Congress is sadly on vacation during the week that I'm here. So I, I, I got a great meeting at the White House earlier today and meeting tomorrow with the EU delegation that works on this issue. Um, but you know, Congress, uh, you know, Chuck Schumer has made some um, big statements about initiatives here. Uh, the people I've asked who could know how Congress works have, have advised me that the things that he's working on will not pass. That's sad for me. Um, though when I when I did watch the the recent hearing um, where you know we had, had Sam Altman and and, and others testifying, um, Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, it was very interesting. Like if you if you just read the transcript, it was very hard and took away the names. It was very hard to tell what the Republicans were saying versus the Democrats. It was it was like they agreed. You had Josh Hawley and Lindsey Graham saying things that were almost indistinguishable from Cory Booker and, and, and Blumenthal um, in the sense that they're you know, talking about creating a new government agency to regulate this stuff. We need regulation. So I think there is a sense in Congress that there's a need. The question of whether something is passable is, is a big one. Um, so I, I actually think something everyone can do right now, I think it's, it's very likely that state legislation um, is, go is going to come first in the United States before meaningful national legislation. So go talk to your state elected officials and ask them what they're doing about AI, um, because that's uh, in, in the US probably where stuff is gonna happen first. And, and you know, there's a lot to build on from what's going on in Europe. Europe's not perfect, not all of their laws are great, but they are way ahead of the US on this. I very much agree with, with David, I think, 
there is a lot of potential in AI and we should not just say like, let's not do this, uh, but rather do all the cool things while having strong regulations in place. I think having government um, catch up with that, uh, it will be hard because AI is moving so quickly, but I very much agree that's very important. Um, I guess my main point would be to keep in mind how important uh, this technology is and how it affects everybody's lives. Um, and also on the other side, because now it's so lucrative, it's becoming even more imbalanced than it's ever been in terms of who's actually working on it and who's at the table when decisions are made. So for whoever is in this webinar or whoever will listen, I think keeping that in mind in terms of say, who are the next students that you will take on to work on this kind of technology? Who are the people that you consult when you make decisions on what you are building? I think it's really essential to have diverse views because as we've seen, I mean, we've seen already this technology is actually not representative of the world. It's very weird in the psychology way. So it's very Western educated and all that. Um, and it's gonna affect all of us. I mean, not just those who are at the table. So in whatever we make as we build technology or bring decide who's going to be at the table, I think keeping that in mind that it, it's essential for this technology to be good, to have diverse points of view. Um, that would be my main argument. I, yeah, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Um, and there, do I have time to address one last question in the chat there or should we wrap? We're, we're actually at, yeah, we're at time. And I think it's actually a great, a great point to end on um, the importance of having, bringing this, the, the diversity of, of, of people and our experiences into, um, into what's being done in this, this space of generative AI and that that's really lacking at this point. So that's a wonderful point to end on. And, and I appreciate you both for both, both kind of emphasizing these, these calls to actions and what we should be thinking about and future students coming up should be thinking about in terms of working in this space and kind of the thought provoking and conscientious ways that you're tackling um, your work. So thank you both for your time. Um, and I will encourage this, this is recorded. So if folks want to share this um, uh, recording with friends, it's available or will shortly soon, I think be available, correct me Midas folks if I'm wrong on the Midas website. Um, and thanks once again for both of you for your time um, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rada. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks both. Bye.